The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth, hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rock Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Good day, tokers and toquettes, and welcome to the show. It is Thursday, March 13th, 2014, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. We're so glad you could make it. we got all sorts of news and information to impart upon the cannabis community today. The ball is still moving forward, but uh, in some places, maybe not the same way we'd like to see it moving forward. We'll talk all about that in today's show. Coming up, we've got some videos today from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, some of the finest former cops, prosecutors, judges, etc., all saying that drugs should be legalized. So stay tuned for that at half past the hour. At 45 past, we're going to have time for a radical rant. We're going to show you how these CBD-only bills are moving us right into the medical marijuana box canyon, something I've been predicting for about four years now. So we'll take a look at that in the radical rant. Also on today's show, it's time for our daily toker tunes for Groovin' Thursday, and we've got a tune from I Love You. No, Isle of View. Well, it's kind of a pun, but we'll explain that when we get to our daily toke routines today. Also on the show today, we'll have a chance to go behind the headlines. There's some new enrollment figures for Colorado's public universities that seem to show a mass spike in enrollments since the passage of Amendment 64 legalizing marijuana. Of course, the people at the colleges are quick to deny that, but we'll take a look at the numbers and the data. You can make your own decision on this. Also, we'll have time for our 420 Radio News. That comes first thing. We'll take a look at the progress of medical marijuana bills in Kentucky and in Georgia, a new poll out of Maryland on me medical marijuana decrim and legalization. We've also got an important decision from the Colorado Court of Appeals to tell you about, and the New York Assembly has attached medical marijuana to its budget. Hell, they're even talking about medical marijuana in the state of Indiana, of all places, and we'll bring that to you in the 420 Radio News. Then, stay tuned for Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio, where we take your calls at 971 533 7111. We interact with you in the chat room. We have ourselves a good time. So stay tuned for that. Hour two, Toker Talk Radio. The news is next. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org live from Rolla J Studios in beautiful Potland, Oregon. Stick around. Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRust.com.
The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the best way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. 420 Radio, your ticket to the Boston Freedom Rally. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. This is your 420 Radio News for Thursday, March 13th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. Kentucky is moving forward with a bill that would legalize the use of cannabidiol by patients. The Kentucky Senate unanimously approved a bill that would allow the medical schools at the state's two public institutions to treat severe seizure disorders with CBD oil. Another Kentucky medical marijuana bill submitted in the House would legalize whole plant medical marijuana, that bill was moved to the Judiciary Committee rather than to the House floor for a vote, effectively killing it for the session, according to its sponsor, Representative Mary Lou Marzian. Senator Julie Denton, co-sponsor of the CBD-only bill, said her bill was the only one that could survive both legislative chambers and get the governor's signature. There is still some question as to how the universities of Kentucky and Louisville would acquire the CBD oil as nothing in the bill provides for the production of cannabis plants, regardless of THC content. The, the Georgia legislature is also considering a CBD-only medical marijuana bill that was unanimously approved by a Senate panel Wednesday. The Georgia Senate Health and Human Services Committee amended the bill to allow for the possession of CBD oil by Georgia patients if they acquire it from out of state which will be necessary because they also eliminated the provision allowing Georgia's public medical schools to grow and process cannabis oil. Crossing state lines with CBD oil is a federal crime, but Georgia lawmakers don't see that as their problem. Quote, let's leave that decision to the parents, said bill sponsor Representative Alan Peake. If they are willing to take the risk that a TSA agent will arrest them with a vial of oil, let's let them make that decision. End quote. The Georgia Senate's version of the CBD-only bill was written with the help of the Prosecuting Attorney's Council of Georgia, reviewed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and supported by the Georgia Sheriff's Association. Voters in Maryland are slightly in support of legalization and strongly in support of decriminalization of marijuana. A new poll by Goucher find, finds that 50% of Marylanders support legalization with just 39% of them opposed. Interestingly, when asked about regulation of marijuana compared to alcohol, support jumps to 57% for treating the two substances similarly. If there are to be punishments for possession of marijuana, 45% of Marylanders prefer fines, 36% support rehab, and only 7% thought jail time was appropriate. A majority of Marylanders don't believe marijuana is a gateway drug, and their support for medical marijuana is at 90%. 
Senate Bill 364, which would decriminalize possession of 10 grams of marijuana as a fine-only offense, passed its second reading. Senate Bill 658, which would legalize an ounce of bud, five grams of hash, a pound of edibles, and a six-pack of tincture, has been stuck in committee since February. But its companion bill, House Bill 880, had its first hearing today. The Colorado Court of Appeals has ruled that defendants who were appealing their marijuana possession cases when Amendment 64 passed may have their convictions overturned. The second highest court in the state ruled on the case of a woman whose multiple drug charges included possession of a third of an ounce of marijuana. The justices explained they had a duty to follow the will of the voters and defendants were eligible for post-conviction relief if, quote, there has been significant change in the law, end quote. The ruling could affect hundreds of minor pot possession convictions and Colorado Attorney General John Southers said his office is reviewing the decision. The New York Assembly has attached a medical marijuana bill to the budget. The bill would authorize a patient to possess up to two and a half ounces of marijuana. Physicians would be able to recommend marijuana for, quote, serious medical conditions, end quote, that include cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord damage, epilepsy, wasting syndrome, Crohn's disease, post-traumatic stress, neuropathy, arthritis, lupus, and diabetes. Medical marijuana would be taxed at 10% of the retail price, and patients would have to join a state registry. The plan would allow for whole plant marijuana and be more expansive than the proposal by Governor Andrew Cuomo to simply revive a dormant 1980 medical marijuana law that critics contend would be unworkable. The Assembly's Democratic majority believes medical marijuana fees and taxes would bring in over $65 million in revenue per year. This has been your 420 Radio News for Thursday, March 13th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available exclusively at 420radio.org. When we come back, we'll go behind the headlines and ask, would legal pot help you choose Colorado's higher education? You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. Starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The Law Office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activists to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1 855 MMJ Laws for more information. That's 855 665 5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your fired up lawyer, or email firedupplawyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855 MMJ Laws, 855 665 5297 for your fired up lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. Call today. I'm a reefer smoking man. Woodpipe Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! 
What's happening, cool cats? This is Big Daddy, and I want you to cruise on over to the Funky Roller Rink. We'll be grooving all night long. Mmm, I like it. Doors open at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, every Thursday night. Funky, delicious. Welcome back, everybody. Quarter after the hour and time for us to go behind the headlines and ask, would legal pot help you choose Colorado higher education? <laughs> Universities and Colora- colleges in Colorado have been experiencing an incredible spike in out-of-state applications, but they are quick to deny that this has anything to do with legalized marijuana. University of Colorado's Director of Admissions, Kevin McLennan, says that applications to the state-run university system are up 30% since Colorado passed Amendment 64 in 2012. But he doesn't believe legalized marijuana had anything to do with it. Instead, McLennan points to increased high school recruitment and adoption of a standardized online application system called Common Application. Well, that excuse really doesn't seem to hold water. There are many universities throughout the nation that have added common application. Uh, This is a, you you fill out one app and it goes to many schools, right? And all of them have been recruiting from high schools. It doesn't explain to me how Colorado's smaller colleges, you know, that don't have the big recruiting power of a public Pac-12 university like University of Colorado. How do the smaller colleges like the private liberal arts school Colorado College also see these dramatic increases in enrollment applications. Their vice president for enrollment, Mark Hatch, thinks it's just part of a longer term trend, explaining, quote, this year is no different. So there's no evidence that our increase is tied to Amendment 64, end quote. Mike Hooker is a spokesman for Colorado State University. He said, quote, I have a hard time believing that someone is going to make that kind of significant decision about investing in their education based on whether they can smoke marijuana in the state, end quote. Will Jones, who's a spokesman for the University of Denver, which has seen an 81% increase in enrollment over the past five years, also doubts that Amendment 64 made any difference because, as he explains, marijuana is still just as illegal on college campuses as it always has been. So given that we've got these mass increases in Colorado colleges and they interviewed some of the students and one 22 year old student actually said that she could understand why uh, marijuana itself wouldn't be a determining factor in choosing your college. But if you had two colleges that were pretty equal and one of them was in a state with legal marijuana, she could understand why you might want to pick that college. Rachel Gillette, who's the executive director of uh, Colorado Normal, also agreed with that, saying that it'd be somewhat like alcohol as far as college students are concerned. They're the uh, majority group as far as the use of marijuana, so it wouldn't be surprising to see enrollment spike based on Amendment 64. I decided to go look at some data, because you know me, I look shit up. A report from the National Student Clearinghouse from December of 2013 found that overall college enrollment nationwide fell for the second year in a row in 2013. Now, part of that's demographics. Uh, There's just fewer high school age people now, right? Uh, We've had the baby boom generation move on, and now there's just a smaller cohort of students graduating high school and then wanting to go on to college. But even with that, we still have seen declines. The decline was seen mostly in private, for-profit, four-year colleges like Colorado College. Nationwide, they dropped 9.7%. Colorado College reports that it has had a massive increase in its enrollment. Public four-year institutions nationwide saw a modest gain of 0.3% in enrollment. Colorado University, up 30%. And regionally, it would seem that enrollment somewhat correlates with marijuana tolerance. The Midwest saw the greatest two-year decline in enrollment, dropping almost 5% from 2011 to 2013, and the South dropped 2.5%. Meanwhile, enrollment in the Northeast, where there's more marijuana tolerance, dropped only 1%. So when Colorado University is experiencing a 30% increase in just one year following marijuana legalization, 
These academic spokespeople have some extra work to do to avoid the bong smoking elephant in the room. And I can tell you, if I was looking to go back to college, I can damn well bet you that the legality of marijuana would weigh pretty significantly in my decision where I would choose to matriculate. Let's just put it this way. I'm not going to go to UT Austin anytime soon. Not that it's a bad school. <laughs> University of Texas is an awesome school. Love it. Love Austin, Texas. Although my condolences go out to the family and friends of the people who were killed and injured by the drunk driver uh, at South by Southwest. We'll talk about, about that in hour two. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. As marijuana goes mainstream, you need to be armed with the facts. Nobody can teach you better than Dr. Mitch Earlywine, Ph.D. You may know Dr. Mitch from his column in High Times Magazine or his weekly appearance on The Russ Belville Show. Dr. Mitch is also the author of some of the best books on marijuana science, culture, history, and health, including Understanding Marijuana, Parents' Guide to Marijuana, Pot Politics, and more. Visit Amazon.com and search for Mitch Earlywine, that's E-A-R-L-E-Y-W-I-N-E, -E, and order your books today. You can also contact Dr. Mitch by email at 420research at gmail.com. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. That's what everybody says these days. It's fun. It's recreational. Some even call it medicine. But every year, millions of young people find out that marijuana is extremely dangerous. Every year they find out that it's deadly. Marijuana smoke is lethal and toxic. Don't believe anything you've ever heard positive about smoking marijuana. It will kill you. Really. It's really gonna kill you. It's don't 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 smoke it. It will really, really kill you. Seriously. It's gonna kill you. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip hop, soul, and funk music. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. All right, welcome back, everybody. Big reminder here at 420 Radio and the Russ Belleville Show we are looking for a Groovin' Thursday music editor. If you'd like to be a part of our team, become an automatic silver VIP, get all sorts of uh, kudos and accolades and bring us a song once a week, we'd love to have you on our team. It's just a volunteer position, but you can be a part of 420 Radio and help shape the sound. And folks, I'm telling you, Groovin' Thursday is the easiest day to find pot-related music because you got R&B, soul, funk, hip-hop, and rap. And 
he could probably fill up a whole year worth of just rap singles about marijuana. So if you're looking to join us, just go to our contact form, 420radio.org slash contact. Send us an email today. Also, if you're into sports, we've begun our 420 Radio Reefer March Madness. You can visit it at rad-r.us slash 420 Madness with a capital M. And uh, we'll provide that link as well on our website. It's our NCAA Big Dance 64 March Madness Bracket contest. We've got a few people involved and uh, if you'd like to join, go to the 420 Radio contact page, look for the subject on Reefer March Madness, send it in and uh, we will send you back the password to join. Uh and uh, we hope you will enjoy. We'll have all sorts of great prizes for our winner. All right, so for today for Groovin Thursday, I got to turn things over to Brian the Red who found this tune from a group called Isle of View. Well, I, f- I found it. It found me. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> I went to the uh, Hempfest tryouts uh, for the being a, getting your band to play on Hempfest um, that the Lion Pride Productions is putting on uh, here at the Hawthorne Theater every Tuesday night. And uh, a couple weeks back, our good friends Mac and Dub were playing, so yeah. I went to you know to give them our support. And this other band uh, was right before them, and they were kind of a you know reggae ish uh, kind of soul ish um they, they were furries so uh <laughs> but it was interesting it was good music so i recorded some of it and of course it was a track called mary jane so i thought we'd add it to the library let's yeah we listen. can't have enough tracks called mary jane no let's let's add another one listen up this is, <laughs> this is isle of you special friend of ours her name's mary jane anybody know her out there do you guys know mary jane, you know mary jane?
come from the Kancha Manso. I'm called the champion in the morning and in the afternoon. But since I'm here and I, so I'm gonna hit it twice. You know, my friends in town, she's got the best smell around. I just can't do the title lock up. My friends in the process, they must come with me. They tear up my clothes. But what the rapper know, love, fire is what me show, 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 show. Across the sea, sipping herbal tea, 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 tea. to learn a song that tells people to say no to drugs. Users are losers and losers are users. So don't use drugs, don't use drugs. Winners don't use and users don't win. So don't use drugs, don't use drugs. If you know a user even part of the time, tell them to quit, take a bite out of crime. Users are losers and losers are users. So don't use drugs. Okay, everybody, if you know we use you even part of the time, tell them to quit, take a bite out and cry. Users are losers, and losers are users. I don't use us, don't use us. Nice going. Now, teach it to your mom and dad and brothers and sisters and friends to help take a bite out of crime. One of the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message, Cops Say Legalize Drugs. We've got some great new videos here from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. You can find them at Cops Say Legalize on the YouTube, youtube.com slash Cops Say Legalize, or find them on the web at leap.cc. For four decades, the United States has been embroiled in a war to eradicate drugs. And as Matt Sledge points out in his piece for the World Post, despite a growing global presence, we are still losing the global war 
on drugs. Joining us now to discuss Half po HuffPost national reporter Matt Sledge. And in the Hangout, we have John Walsh, senior associate for drug policy at the Washington Office on Latin America, and Sean Dunnigan, a former DEA intelligence analyst and a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Sure. Pleasure. Thank so, you. Matt, in your piece, you emphasize the large DEA presence overseas. Where exactly are we seeing these DEA, DEA agents more prominently? Right. It would, it would actually almost be easier to ask, where aren't these DEA agents? They're everywhere from Paris to Kabul. Uh, we have a huge presence in Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Mexico, Colombia, and uh, Peru. Um, and we also have agents in places like Afghanistan uh, where they've been deployed to fight opium production and Thailand uh, where they're also fighting the, the heroin trade. Now it's interesting and specifically in regards to Latin America with Mexico and with uh, South America uh, we see where they move in and cha start changing things we see the drug trade move into different countries where they don't really have the, as much of a presence yet, right? Right. It, it's not all about DEA agents. We also give uh, these countries huge amounts of money in terms of aid for law enforcement, something right. like $2 billion a year. Uh, but uh, people who analyze the drug war call this the balloon effect. Uh, cocaine, and, uh, cocaine and heroin production are way down in Colombia, um, and they've ballooned out to other Latin American countries uh, like Peru and Bolivia, and we've also seen a, a lot of the uh, momentum, if you will, in the drug war move to Mexico, which is uh, a big reason why we've seen this huge spike in homicides there. Now, the, this balloon effect, is this the only result that we're seeing from the global presence? Is there any other, are there any other beneficial consequences that we've seen? Right. Well, you know, I, I guess the, the reason we've, we've been sold the idea that we need to send uh, all these agents and all this money abroad uh, is to hopefully reduce the negative consequences mm -hmm. of drugs, both uh, in these countries abroad and in the United States. Uh, just looking at the United States, laying aside the issue of, uh, you know, all this violence abroad, we've not seen the price of major illegal drugs like cocaine, heroin, or marijuana drop. And that's after 40 years of fighting this war on drugs. Well, it's essentially gone up. Or, we, we, yeah, we, 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 have, we have seen the price of these drugs yeah, drop. Excuse, yeah, excuse, excuse me. Uh, yeah. So we, we, haven't, we haven't seen the, the flow of these drugs into the United States mm -hmm. constricted to the extent that it would make it more difficult to get these. Mm -hmm. We've seen the price drop. I mean, we've been covering the, quote, heroin epidemic around the country on HuffPost Live. We've been covering that for, done a number of segments about it. And we've seen the price on heroin drop as well as the purity of heroin rise. Now, this is coming from Afghanistan and from, and from uh, South America. What are we seeing in terms of the policing? What, is the actual, what are the actual measures that DEA agents are using in these countries to combat Right. It really depends on the country that you're talking about. Uh, you know, I, I discussed this mm -hmm. with Sean and with another former DEA agent. It's really varied. In some countries, these agents can carry a gun. In others, they can't. In some countries, uh, these agents are going out on drug raids uh, with local law enforcement. And in other countries, they're just kind of sitting in the office, uh, maybe doing intelligence analysis, you know, trying mm -hmm. to find out uh, who the big cartels and traffickers are in any given country. Uh, so it ranges from really hands-on uh, to other countries like, say, Russia or China, uh, where these agents are mostly confined to a desk. Sean, you're a former DEA agent, and you served in Guatemala and Mexico. Do you think the, the global presence of the DEA is an effective method? Well, no, and, and I thank you so much for having me on. Just as a clarification, I was an intelligence analyst with DEA. I was not, a, uh, not an agent. Uh, but no, I mean, to answer your question, <laughs> right, if we look at, uh, at the metrics of success, uh, there's no way that one could come to the conclusion that this has been, uh, that, you know, that this is effective, having so many uh, DEA personnel overseas and the other things we do overseas, but the vetted units and, and the money that's sent uh, for aid for interdiction and eradication. Uh, no, it, it's certainly not effective. I mean, if it were effective, we would see uh, drugs less available in the United States, we would see rising prices, we would see declining usage rates, uh, we would see a weakening rather than a strengthening of 
the uh, the transnational criminal organizations that deal in drugs. And, and, you know, of course, we're not seeing any of that. So, no, it, it certainly is, is not an effective strategy. Sean, you were, uh, you did intelligence analysis in Guatemala. What was your experience like there? What were the things that you were seeing? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the extent of the U.S. counter drug footprint uh, in a country like Guatemala um, that is largely dependent on uh, on U.S. aid of all kinds. Um, you know, we were involved in assisting the judiciary, all levels of the police, um, you know, all sort of political institutions within Guatemala, uh, trying to, to pop those up. And so, you know, along with that comes a great deal of influence right, for the United States. And I think that that's one of the uh, kind of one of the reasons that we, that we pursue that international policy so aggressively. You know, I sort of see uh, our international counter drug efforts as sort of replacing, you know, our more overtly military efforts uh, during the Cold War. You know, the Cold War evaporated. Uh, we no longer had that uh, counterinsurgency mission throughout Latin America to assert influence in the region. And the drug war largely uh, replaced that. And now drug funding, drug aid uh, is sort of that mechanism of influence that we use throughout Latin America. John, I'm curious what, how, how this presence is affecting global relations for the United States. Well, for a long time, you know, the U.S. is certainly the, the driver of this prohibitionist policy. Um, you know, that it, it's sort of our strategy. We've imposed it to a large extent on the rest of the world, um, kind of uh, forced the leaders, particularly in Latin America, to follow along with that strategy or risk losing aid or running afoul of international counter drug conventions. Um, more recently, you know, of course, that's starting to change. I think one of, one of the interesting recent developments in Guatemala is a new president, Toto Pérez Molina, uh, who is by no means a, a left-wing dove. Um, one of his first statements after assuming office uh, was to challenge the U.S. drug war. Of course, we see Uruguay, uh, Mexico. I mean, you know, so we're really, I think, starting to see a shift that eventually will lead to a critical mass where you know, leaders in Latin America that are, you know, bearing the brunt of the, of the drug war um, are going to challenge the U.S. effectively and really uh, kind of move away from this law enforcement-centric prohibitionist policy towards some more, more progressive counter-drug strategies. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the more progressive counter-drug strategies in just a minute. John, uh, you're the Senior Associate for Drug Policy at the Washington Office on Latin America. Talk to me about what you're hearing, what you're understanding about our relationship with Latin America and how that corresponds with the presence of DEA agents in, in some of these countries. Well, as was pointed out earlier, uh, the DEA is only a piece of that problem, I would say, in terms of uh, U.S. relations with the rest of the hemisphere. Drug policy has been one of the centerpieces of U.S. policy towards Latin America now for several decades, and it has been an irritant the entire time. And I think uh, Sean is right that the changes that are happening in the region now are often in reaction to a hardline, zero tolerance, you'll do what we say approach on the part of the U.S. And countries are saying, we've done this now for decades. We've adopted your recipes, sometimes under duress, and it's not working for us. It didn't work for you. And we're going to try some new approaches. And Uruguay is, the, I think, the most dramatic uh, example of that because they passed a, a law that would legalize and regulate cannabis. How has that worked out for them? Well, so far, the question is, is there international pressure for them to backtrack? I think in the, within the region, um, if other countries aren't coming out, vocally in support, at least they're not condemning it either. In other words, there's the flexibility from their colleagues in the region to go forward. Uh, they still have to write the rules for the new law, so it's premature to say how it's going to work. I think they have a good chance to make it work. And the other interesting, really interesting point is, in the past, even within the past few years, the United States might have been vocally opposed and pushed back on Uruguay and cite the international conventions as a reason why this kind of innovation could not be permitted. Well, because Colorado and Washington passed similar laws and because the federal government is, I think, correctly accommodating those laws going forward at the local level in the U.S., the U.S. is in no position now to push back on Uruguay. And I think that opens this space, further opens this space for innovation, experimentation. And experimentation means, all right, well, let's learn. And the comparison isn't, are we doing better than a perfect situation, or is the comparison, can we do better than the disaster that we have now? 
And I think the experience will show that we can do better. Absolutely. Uh, Matt, in your piece, you also talk about FAST teams, foreign deployed advisory support teams. What exactly are those? Um, they're kind of like the, uh, the SWAT teams of the DEA abroad. Uh, they came about uh, when we started to go to Afghanistan uh, to serve as, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the drug arm of, of drug enforcement arm of our military mission there. Um, and uh, after they were deployed in Afghanistan, they've started uh, to be transferred to uh, Latin America. Uh, and a lot of this was kind of happening under the radar uh, until uh, just a couple years ago um, in, in Honduras when there was a, um, uh, a drug raid that kind of went horribly wrong and it appears that several civilians were killed. Uh, and there's a lot, still a lot of murkiness around exactly what happened. There was a FAST team there. Uh, there was a recent long New Yorker article about this. Um, and we still don't have a lot of answers about what happened. Um, but I think it's, it's caused a lot of people in Latin America to rethink uh, the very aggressive uh, stance that the DEA takes in some of these countries, you know, very much going out on these missions uh, you know, with big, loaded weapons ready to enforce. Mm -hmm. and this situa this, what you're talking about here, this one situation with a FAST team, this is only really one that we know about. Is this something that we're hearing more and more happens uh, more often? Um, I, I can't answer that. Uh, maybe, maybe Sean can, uh, just because he has sure. uh, better connections there. Sean, uh, is it, are, are these fast teams, why are they so problematic? Is this something that happens more often than just this one uh, story that, that Matt was telling? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not familiar with another incident like that uh, where there was a shooting of innocence. Uh, but, you know, anytime you take what are essentially troops, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're agents, they're badged and credentialed agents, but they're flying with military weapons and military helicopters to what could reasonably describe, be described as a hostile area. Um, you know, bad things can happen. Uh, so I'm not familiar with another incident like that. Um, if there were other incidents like that, I would not expect the DEA to be particularly forthcoming, uh, just as they have not been forthcoming releasing uh, details of, uh, of the, the shooting in Honduras. Um, but, you know, it's, I mean, invariably when you kind of set something like that up and, and put that in motion, you know, um, it's a dangerous situation. You're, you're creating a dangerous situation where tragedies can occur. Um, and, you know, that, that's, it's incredible to think, you know, really of the, the violation of national sovereignty in these countries where fast teams operate. I mean, we would not accept a, a Black Hawk full of Royal Canadian Mounted Police to be flying through New York, right? Um, but that's essentially what we're asking uh, our Latin American and, of course, Latin American countries and, of course, Afghanistan and, and throughout the world. So, you know, it, it's just a, 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 a tactic that I think really invites uh, – more tragedies like what occurred in Honduras, and and again, you know, kind of invites that pushback against the, the broader American counter drug policy. Mm -hmm. Now, John, if we all agree, myself included, that we need a new approach, uh, we're talking about the global level, but I think on the local level in the United States, we knew, uh, need a new approach in terms of this drug war. What what does that new approach look like? What are what are the alternatives? A lot, lots of it is already being talked about and actually already happening. In the in the first instance. Uh, we over-incarcerate dramatically. We use incarceration as if it's a cheap and effective way to deal with the problem. It's neither. Um, and I think there's an increasing recognition, bipartisan in this country, that we need to wean ourselves of this over-incarceration binge and find alternatives for dealing with not just users who shouldn't be locked up for using at all, but low-level, nonviolent dealers. There need to be alternatives to incarceration and, and strict criminal enforcement. Doesn't the, also need, John, doesn't the alternatives, yeah. and take this to Matt and, and Sean as well, the alternatives for these low-level deal, dealers and the alternatives for these very poor countries a lot of times is economic resources. We need alternative economic resources. The drug trade is essentially, for a lot of people, their only means to an economy. Right. And, the, you know, this is something that, that the Obama administration, rhetorically at least, has, has, has emphasized uh, for years. We need to build these economic alternatives. We need to create some opportunity for the poor 
poppy farmer mm -hmm. in Afghanistan to grow something else instead. Um, I, 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 you know, it's a troubled enterprise just because any economic development efforts that the U.S. Uh, attempts to uh, prop up are troubled. Economic development is really tough. Um, also, but, uh, how difficult is it to create economic, a sustainable economic development that can in any way rival what right. you could make I off mean, of the you can make drug trades? Incredible profits off of off of opium. Usually yeah. not when you're the low level farmer, but when you're higher up in the criminal mm -hmm. enterprise. Um, an, another thing that I talked about with John uh, uh, for this piece that was uh, really interesting to me was there's a big emphasis in a lot of drug enforcement in going after you know, the biggest criminal groups, trying to get the most kilos on the table for that nice photo op, uh, you know, or for the, the picture where you have this big, uh, f uh, big uh, uh, pile of marijuana bales uh, burning up. Uh, what John suggested, suggested was that maybe instead of going after the most kilos, we should go after the most violent organizations, the right. most violent people, uh, you know, because uh, the violence caused by these drug organizations is so disruptive. Mm -hmm. John, I want to give you the last word as he was bringing up in term, uh, a conversation that the two of you were having and going after the most violent organizations. Haven't we, is that not something that we've seen in, in Mexico and seen the deaths skyrocket even more? Or is the drug war in Mexico as vague as it is, as it is here and in other countries? I, I think we've seen, clearly seen going after the most violent in the United States. It's not so clear that we've seen that in Mexico. Part of it Part of that formula is making it clear, this is what we're doing, being transparent about it. We are going after you because you're the most violent. And if anyone want, wants to try to take your place, they're going to they're gonna be our focus as well. The point is an acknowledgement that there's a global drug market. It will continue to exist. We can't eradicate that, but we can shape the market in ways that are less violent in particular and less harmful overall for communities. In the United States, there's been a lot of this done at the local level that has prevented violence and reduced levels of violence. In foreign affairs, the United States ought to be presenting this as a much more productive and constructive way to do drug enforcement. The problem is drug enforcement is a sort of single vision. We just have to chase the drugs. We have to stop the supply. That's not going to bring us very far. And rather than decrease violence, it's going to tend to spark it. Well, John, thank you so much. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. And Sean, as well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a conversation that I'm sure, I'm positive, that we're going to continue having here at the Huff, uh, HuffPost Live and on the World Post, where you can find this article. Keep watching HuffPost Live. There's a lot more coming up next. All right. Big thanks to the folks at Law Enforcement Against Prohibition for providing that video from HuffPost Live. Sean Dunnigan, of course, has been a guest on this show on a prior episode or two. So you can check our archives for that at 420radio.org. Check the Thursday episodes. Those are the ones where we feature our Leap speakers. We're going to take a short break and uh, we won't have enough time for a rant at the end. So uh, we'll have one more short video from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We'll move the rant into hour two. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Four twenty radio, freeing your mind twenty four hours a day. In the best of the rest of the news, residents of Colorado will go green this New Year's, but not because they drink too much alcohol on New Year's Eve. It's because on Wednesday, the first day of two thousand fourteen, recreational marijuana shops will officially become legal in that state. Personal use was already allowed in Colorado following the twenty twelve elections. But the start of totally legal marijuana shops is something new and different and totally exciting. For the first time ever, Americans will get the chance to purchase marijuana just like they do alcohol. And what's more, Colorado officials believe the allure of legal marijuana shops will lead to a big tourism boom, helping bring in much needed jobs and revenue to their state. Joining me now for more on this story is Ma Major Neil Franklin, Executive Director of LEAP, 
law enforcement against prohibition, a retired state police major in the Maryland State Police Department and the Baltimore Police Department. Major, welcome, welcome back to the program. Great to have you with us. Thanks for having me back. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, first, the basics. Uh, legalized pot shops. What's this going to mean for people in Colorado? It's going to mean many things for the people in Colorado. Number one, I think it was in 2010 they spent about $37 million on arresting people, processing people for possession of marijuana. In that state? In that state. So that's the savings, the direct savings right there wow. from the taxpayers. But, but more importantly, it's, it's the being free from that, uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever been arrested before. I but, have, actually, but it was for protesting against the war and stuff like that. Right, the but it's not a pleasant experience. No, it's not at okay? all. <laughs> uh, not just the, the act of being arrested, but, but the fallout from that. You know, many people have lost their jobs, you know. Yeah. You, you spend a night or two in a detention center and, 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 and that process and being fingerprinted and, and the money that it costs, mm -hmm. you know, to hire an attorney and, and, and everything that comes after that, they will be free of that. Yeah. But, but more importantly, at least from my perspective, from one of, of law enforcement, number one, the police are going to be able to pay attention to crimes of violence more now. Real criminals. Real criminals, you know, the rapes, the robberies, domestic violence, crimes against our children, which have been been neglected you know for for so long now in addition to that um, I think that uh, the citizens of, of Colorado are going to see jobs coming um, they're going to be one of the very few states that to economically pull themselves you know up out of this uh, downward spiral that many states and cities are in today yeah. <clears throat> what we've been hearing about are the direct cost savings the direct money that will be coming from taxes, but no one's talking about the indirect savings and the indirect money that's going to be coming into the, the economy in Colorado from, from those thousands of people who will be put to work. Right. You know, they'll be paying taxes. You mean like, be, like after Prohibition ended, the, the restaurant business boomed in, absolutely. in, in the country's cities? Cause absolutely. Because you have a glass of wine with dinner. So, so all these new employees are not just paying taxes, yeah. They're spending money in the local stores and buying cars and, and buying homes and paying their bills on time. We, we have we have just a minute left, but I'm curious your your take from the from the law and you're, you're a police officer well, from the law enforcement point. I think this is a bad day. January first is going to be a bad day for criminals. It's going to be a bad day for the cartel. At least those who are operating in Colorado yeah. and soon to be Washington State. Yeah. and outside of the, the country, Uruguay, it's a bad day for them and for our local gangs, you know, because they're not, they're no longer will they be able to make money selling marijuana on the street corners and, and the violence that they cause from that. At least 60% of their proceeds from selling drugs is gone in Colorado. Wow. So it's a good day for police. It's a good day for police. It's a good day for our kids who are no longer going to be recruited into the illegal marijuana selling business, selling marijuana in our schools. I mean, how can anyone, other than criminals, be right. against this new policy in Colorado? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, a brilliant analysis. Yeah. Major Franklin, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, thanks for having me. Happy Pleasure. New Year. Pleasure and honor to meet you. Happy New Year. Thanks. Now, of course, uh, from the RT Russia Today channel, and uh, that was Tom Hartman, who uh, was a liberal talk show host out here in Portland, Oregon and was my mentor when I began talk radio. Uh, actually had dinner with him a few times and, uh, and he gave me a lot of good tips when I was first starting out in 2006. So good to see Neil Franklin there with Tom Hartman talking about Colorado legalization. We're gonna talk some more about that when we come back for hour two, Toker Talk Radio. We'll also take your calls at 971-533-7111. Got a radical rant loaded up on the CBD only bills. Plus, we'll take a look at a new bill just passed by the House GOP to force President Obama to crack down on marijuana. And yeah, we'll see how that works. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Bellville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed.
Thank you.